uh, Jim. Speaker. Yeah. And internally, I think we're waiting for Dwan as well, right? Yes. Yeah. Dwan's here now. And Jim's here too. Hey, Christine. Yes. Yeah, did you uh, did you attend that meeting yesterday evening? Yes, I did. Uh, sorry about that. I just that like that late a notice. I can't sh switch things around. Did they talk anything about their executive director? Yes, he actually attended the the I'm meeting. Sorry, Jim, Christine. That's not notice. We're at an HP. Oh, yeah. I can I can talk to you about it later. Or, um, okay. I'll follow up with an email. Way to be on it, Juan. <laughs> Okay, it seems like we have everyone here. Um, Chris, if you want to kick it off. Yeah, good morning, everybody. Uh, thanks for joining us. Uh, my role here is as simple as it, as it gets. I, I welcome you and then I hand it off. But, uh, <laughs> but let me just say that there has been a lot of work that's been done thus far. Uh, this is meeting to talk about how to spend 31 million dollars um, in the in the most effective way and I know staff has been feverishly working behind the scenes uh, which I'm really grateful for uh, Greg and Christine in particular and um, hopefully we will be efficient today but without further ado I will hand it off thanks Greg sure thanks Chris um, Kim, do you want to start with just the administrative uh, Zoom announcements? Oh, okay. I was just getting ready to ask you that. Okay. Um, <laughs> welcome, committee members, liaisons, and members of the public to the Legal Services Trust Fund Commission Home Homelessness Prevention Committee meeting. We will um, begin at 10 a.m. We are using Zoom with the goal of, of to foster a more inclusive environment and effective meeting. If you would like to make a comment during the meeting, please type I have a comment or I have a question in the chat and a message will be sent to the host. Alternatively, you can also use the raise hand feature. In an effort for transparency for all those joining this meeting, whether by phone or, or by Zoom, we request that you refrain from having side conversations on the chat about the content of the meeting. Again, the chat feature is utilized simply as a tool for you to virtually indicate that you would like to speak in order to help the chair facilitate the discussion. Also, this meeting is being recorded and will be uh, posted to the State Bar's website. Friendly reminder, please be aware of your surroundings behind you. Um, those joining the, me the Zoom meeting on a computer, when you went on mute, holding down the space bar will temporarily unmute you. If you use your phone to dial into the meeting, please be sure that your computer microphone is on mute to avoid audio feedback. And while joining the audio via computer, it is highly recommended if an individual loses audio, they can join separately by using the Zoom call, conference call number. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kim. Okay, so as you can probably see on the screen, and uh, Banafshe, I did receive your note that you're just dialing in on the phone. Uh, we've put together an agenda to guide our discussion for today. Um, so first item is just to do roll call, and I will uh, call out names just to make sure that we have a quorum for today. Uh, Chris Schreiber? Here. Banafshe Aklagi? Yes, here. Thank you. Amin al Saraf, I believe is absent today. Herman DeBose. Present. Corey Friedman. Here. Eric Giskin. Eric Giskin is absent, it seems. Uh, Jim Meeker. Here. Richard Reynitz. Here. Kim Savage. Here. Okay. And on the uh, staff side, uh, Greg Shin is here, Christine Holmes, I see Dawn Nguyen. Um, anybody else who I missed that would like to announce themselves, please? 
Is Bonnie Huff from the Judicial Council? Hi, good morning, Bonnie. Good morning. And Selena Copeland attending from LAC. Hi, hi everybody. Good morning, Selena. Okay, so we have uh, established quorum and it is, uh, what time is it? 10.06 that we're starting here. Um, is there anybody on the phone that would like to make a public comment? This is Selena from LAC and I just made a comment via chat so I wanted to make sure I made it orally as well. Um, Equal Justice Conference is actually going on right now. Oops. <laughs> Equal Justice Conference is actually going on right now and they're making many of their sessions free and open to the public and the one this morning that's happening right now is on um, uh, evictions in the, the era of COVID and I just wanted to recommend the, the little bit that I saw I thought might be really relevant for this group um, if they record it later perhaps you could watch or I'm happy to see if I can get a summary from somebody I know there'll be some ability to have some um, discretionary grants and I think that there may be some very interesting data from um, the group that's presenting today. And I think just, just you know, FYI, I think that EJC is doing all of their morning sessions free because they're non-CLE and their afternoon sessions you have to pay for. So if there's other sessions that you want to attend tomorrow morning, I think that they're free through Facebook Live. Okay. All right, thank you, Selena, for that information. Appreciate it. Um, item number three um, is part of your meeting materials packet. There was a meeting summary and action items from the November 12th, 2019 meeting. Don't know if uh, anybody wanted to call out any items or if anybody wanted to make a motion to approve those uh, summary and action items. So moved. I'll second. Okay, so Krish. Schreiber moved, Corey Friedman seconded. I will go ahead and do roll call vote. Uh, Chris Schreiber? Sorry, yes. Okay, thank you. Banafshe Aklagi? Yes. Amin Al Saraf is absent. Herman DeBose? Uh, abstain, I wasn't there. Thank you. Corey Friedman? Yes. Eric Iskin is absent. Actually, I'm here. I just got on. Sorry. Oh, um, okay. Yes. Thank you. I didn't see you, Eric. Jim Meeker? Uh, abstain. I wasn't a member at that meeting. Thank you. Richard Reines? Abstain. Same reason. Thank you. Kim Savage? Abstain. Same reason. Thank you very much. Okay. The motion passes. We go to item number four, uh, which is uh, the discussion and action items for today and the primary reason why we've uh, gathered together. There's four items on the agenda today. And just to sort of level set, the first two items that you see on the screen, items A and B, are in reference to the, what I'll call in air quotes, the old homelessness prevention funds. Uh, this was the $20 million funds that uh, we started to talk about back in mid-June, and the funds got diverse, uh, dispersed in late 2019 and early 2020. And then the second two items for C and D for today is in reference to the new $31 million fund, which we're obviously talking about the disbursement schedule and the processes around that. Um, so with that, uh, for items A and B, I am just going to give sort of an oral report and then open it up for any discussions and conversations. Um, so on item A, as I think most of you know, and if you didn't know, the grant period for the original $20 million EHP funding, uh, there was a hard end date of June 30th, 2021, where all of the funds that were dispersed needed to be fully spent down by that date, which is a little less than a year from now. And uh, there was also a stipulation that there would be no carryovers uh, permitted. Um, of course, all of this was decided before the current pandemic. Um, so when the shelter in place orders went into effect sometime in March, uh, early part of this year, 
we fielded a handful of phone calls from some of the grant recipients. And I should point out, it was really a handful um, who asked about the possibility of potentially extending that grant uh, termination date of June 30, 21. And I think, you know, the, the genesis of those questions was the fact that in March, April of this year, all of the programs were sort of resetting how they're delivering services in the new remote environment. And I think there was some preliminary concerns that perhaps they wouldn't be able to spend down funds as they had originally projected. So we reached out to our legislative contacts um, and primarily that was uh, Dwan Nguyen from our office. And I believe she had also had some conversations with uh, Bonnie Hoff to uh, see if there would be the possibility of extending that date. And um, we had a few sort of conversations both orally and through email and the feedback that we received from our legislative contact was that there would not be any extensions beyond that June 30, 2021 date. Um, and especially in the current sort of uh, limited funding environment, any funds that weren't spent, um, they felt that those could be sort of redistributed to other areas where uh, those funding might be required. Right, um, can so I that, jump in and just clarify a little bit? Um, so you know, when we're in conversations with um, the Department of Finance, who handles, um, you know, the distribution of these funds, they said that their process is that you don't request extensions until um, the year of. Um, so, the, you know, so they didn't want to go outside of protocol. So that means it's not necessarily that they would deny the extension request, but that um, they, they wouldn't process it until um, at, at the beginning of 2021. Um, so just to clarify that. So I think Best case scenario is that um, I think we're in a bit of a holding pattern. Once again, I don't get the sense, and Dawn, correct me if you're wrong, based on your feedback or Christina, if you've heard anything differently, I don't get the sense that there are a lot of organizations that are looking to potentially request an extension, but uh, I guess it's sort of to be determined. And I think if we opened up uh, the possibility that that could happen, I don't we, we might see a different picture, but that's kind of where I see where we are right now. Dawn, do you um, so I, I've gotten also a handful of inquiries. I don't know the exact amount. Um, I, I think the, the program wanted flexibility, um, but but they do expect um, that, you know, when courts um, are open again and when the moratorium is, is lifted on evictions, that, that there is going to be a surge in need. Um, so so they do expect to, um, to spend it down. However, uh, if they had flexibility, um, it would help them um, kind of better plan for the year. Um, but given that we don't have that flexibility, I, I, you know, what I've been told anecdotally is that um, we, we, they'll still be able to spend it down. Uh, Corey, I think you're on mute. So it's, it's June of 2021 that has to be spent put down by, is that right? That's correct. Yeah. Is there any possibility of an executive order, a governor's order on um, suspending that deadline, or, or that's probably too far in the future to get their attention at this point, I'm guessing. Well, this is by statute that June um, 30th, 2021, that was built into the... Um, no, the I understand, but I mean, I don't know what the limits are about of the governor's power. I just know he's been issuing executive orders, um, you know, um, lifting deadlines in statute. So that's okay. why... I yeah, we haven't heard anything. I don't know how, how far up along in the totem pole. It doesn't seem like this is, um, you know, high priority right now, but maybe, but maybe Bonnie has some insights. Well, I haven't heard anything recently. I know that when the discussion was broached earlier, we were told that it was too early, given that there's another year to spend the funding. Mm -hmm. And I think the other sensitivity is I think we're in a really difficult position to say we can't actually spend um, housing funding when we've got new housing funding and the whole pitch is we need more funding. Yeah. So um, it's, you know, it's, it's a tough, it's a tough situation. I think if, if we had a major, I mean, if the moratorium stayed for another year, I think we're in a whole different position, but um, that seems really unlikely. I Hi, Chris, were you saying something? Yeah, I was just gonna echo Bonnie's point. The, this is about politics to me, like not spending this money in what looks to be a forthcoming surge seems, um, 
would be bad optics. So it doesn't sound like there's a decision to make today in, in any event, but we should be trying to communicate to the programs that they should maybe not expect the flexibility, especially with more money coming down the pike. You know, and that, 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 that has been um, pretty much the messaging, um, Chris, that, you know, and, and we, and, and programs have said as a community, um, you know, we'll, we'll spend down the funds. So. Okay. So, uh, you're right, Chris. I don't think there was a specific action item or a voting item, um, but staff will continue to deliver that message that June 30, 2021, uh, barring any sort of changes or uh, additional guidance that we received, uh, that that will be the hard stop date for the original 20 million in funding. Okay, so somewhat related to that, uh, item B, discuss extension of uh, mid-grant financial reporting deadline of August 20. 20. Um, so just to give you a little bit of background, uh, as part of the original $20 million funding, we had built in a requirement for the programs to report back to the state bar in August of 2020 uh, and let us know of their progress on their program, uh, specifically with respect to how they were progressing on their spend down of the funds that they were granted. And the idea behind that request was to allow us to get a sense for whether they were on track to fully spend down, given what we had just talked about in item A. Um, and so somewhat related, uh, basically due to COVID, uh, we had also uh, received some questions about um, whether we could extend that date beyond the August 2020. And I think staff's concern was that perhaps um, getting a picture in light of what happened with COVID wouldn't uh, give sort of an accurate picture of whether they uh, were fully, uh, not fully, whether they were on track to spend down the funds that they were granted. Um, and ultimately what staff wanted to do uh, after receipt of those reports was to determine whether there were any programs that we thought were going to have any problems fully, spend, fully spending down their grants. And if so, go through a reallocation process to distribute those monies to potentially other programs that could spend it down uh, within the time frame. Um, so given that uh, staff thought that it might be appropriate to give the programs a little bit more time, um, essentially till the end of the third quarter um, to provide their information back to us, which might give us a little bit more realistic picture of what their spend down activity is. So ultimately what we're suggesting is since the start of the grant period through the third quarter of 2020, which would be the end of September, we would give programs one month after that, so end of October, to report back their um, spend down activity. So we're moving essentially up the date by two months. This is Rich. Um, will uh, any of the grant recipients of this early round who uh, staff determines uh, ought to, uh, will not be able to make their spend and um, uh, that results in a reallocation, will that affect their competitiveness for the second round of funding from the 31 million or the 25% of the 31 million? I'll make a general comment is that as part of the evaluation process, uh, especially for the RFP component, the competitive component of the funding, uh, we are looking at programs ability and history in terms of being able to spend down funds. Um, so I, that certainly wouldn't be the only decision, but that would be one of the data points that we would look at. So I certainly don't want to speak for the committee, but that would be a point of consideration. How much weight the committee decides to put on that item, I think would be up to all of you. Any other comments or thoughts on item B? Just what, was there any feedback from the programs? Um, yeah, actually on this particular item, we did receive more questions than on item A. And I think generally speaking, it's not that they were requesting per se an extension, 
but they were just uh, reaching out to find out, you know, is specifically, is the August 2020 deadline uh, still in effect? And if so, well, you know, what specifically uh, do we require from them? And the guidance that we've been providing to them thus far is that uh, the HP committee meeting was uh, meeting today and would be deciding on whether there would be an extension granted. So I think if ultimately there's no objection to that, that would be the message that we would communicate out to all of the programs and the grantees. And I haven't had a number of firms that did ask me um, the, uh, the, for, for this specific request. Uh, they said an extra quarter uh, would reflect um, more accurately their expenditures before reallocating because it will show um, that they, they haven't spent down much um, if we do just just two quarters. Um, you know, the, the, I guess the, the, the difficulty for us is um, I think originally when this was planned, um, we, we wanted to, if we were to reallocate to give the new programs um, ample time to spend that down. So, you know, the flip side of this is that we're cutting into a, an additional quarter um, that another program could use. Um, but I, I think it does seem like most of the programs are in the same boat. So um, it feels um, reasonable. Uh, Selena, I think you have a comment on this item. Sure, just a quick comment in support of staff recommendation. I've also talked with a lot of programs, and I think that if uh, programs had to stay with their original deadline for submitting um, updates, I think that you would see a lot of programs thinking that they, they couldn't spend down the funds and a lot of redistribution unnecessarily. So I think that staff's recommendation is, is conservative and very responsive, and I think will actually make it easier in the long run to not redistribute over and over again uh, because programs will, will have a more accurate picture after a little bit more time. And we also have to, um, once we review the third quarter um, uh, expenditures, um, we'll, we'll uh, need to um, react pretty quickly to give um, ample notice to the new programs. Um, so, you know, we'd like to roll back to um, the committee. Um, we'll have a staff recommendation of which programs need to be allocated, but I don't think that we have decided on what those parameters are. Um, for instance, if you haven't spent down X, um, that it'll go, go, go to be redistributed. Programs are, have noticed that um, you know, we're, we'll be looking at expenditures to see if they're on track, um, but there's not an explicit like X percent. Um, so we'll, we'll definitely um, think about that and then roll back um, to you with a recommendation and have you decide um, on the allocation, reallocation. Why not, and Greg, I have a question. Will, will the delay, assuming we approve it, um, in submitting these status reports put staff in yet another crunch? Um, probably a little bit, but I mean, it, it is what it is. I mean, I, I think this recommendation is the right thing to do. So, um, uh, you know, my hope obviously is that when we get the reports back, there will only be a few, if any, that uh, are having any problems doing spend down. So um, maybe there won't be as much to do, but so that's what I'm keeping my fingers crossed about. But uh, if, if, that's not the case that could potentially impact sort of what we need to do. But I mean, it's, it's certainly doable. Just mindful of the crunch that you, we, we put ourselves in with all the extensions that we allowed for the uh, filing of the IOLTA applications and then not extending the back end by which we had to deliver the information. So you guys need to protect yourselves a little bit. <laughs> I mean, it was, we, we did think about that. Thank you, Eric, um, for, for that comment. Um, but we do think that if we went and did a sweep right now, um, we might be actually creating more work for ourselves because we will, in fact, see a number of programs that have spend down issues. Um, is, there, is there a back end deadline that should then be correspondingly extended? Well, so the, back, guys... the, the, the deadline that's not movable is that June 30th deadline. So that's what we're working backwards from. Um, that's why agenda item B and A and B are related. Um, so, you know, depending on when we move the deadline to review the expenditures, it's going to eat away um, towards um, uh, towards that June 30th, 2021 deadline to spend down all the funds. I, I would move to adopt the staff's recommendation on the deadline. I, I think all, everything you said made sense. And um, as was said earlier by Chris, I, there, there's probably not too much risk that programs are not going to be able to spend down in the current climate. So um, once the, now, now that the initial days of COVID are over and we're on into the long haul. 
I appreciate that motion, Corey. Is there a second? I'll second it. Uh, Herman Debo seconded. Yeah. Okay, I'll take roll call on this item. Uh, Chris Schreiber? Yes. Banafshe Aplagi? Yes. Amin Al Saraf is absent. Herman DeVos? Yes. Corey Friedman? Yes. Eric Iskin? Yes. Jim Meeker? Yes. Richard Vinas? Yes. Kim Savage? Yes. Okay, thank you. The motion passes. Okay, moving on to item C on the agenda. Okay, so review and discuss the proposed timeline for the administration of the 31 million national mortgage settlement funding. So now we're switching gears to the new $31 million funding. Um, so as uh, Chris had mentioned earlier, uh, staff has been busy working on uh, sort of the administrative aspects of um, all of the details that need to be finalized to go ahead and start uh, rolling out the, the application process as well as the details that we will need to communicate to the programs and uh, applicants for this new funding. Um, so Christine, if we can jump ahead one slide, I think it shows the proposed timeline. And just by way of background, um, in formulating this, we uh, worked with uh, several different groups and individuals. Uh, there was the HP committee working group comprised of Chris Schreiber, Jim Meeker, as well as Kim Savage in kind of bouncing off some of these dates and ideas. And we also spoke to Bonnie Huff and Selena just to kind of solicit their feedback as well. Um, so at a high level, uh, obviously item number one, we're meeting today with uh, all of you to talk about the details with respect to what staff has put together so far, um, assuming that uh, you all approve the, uh, the proposals from staff uh, we will take these same items to the full commission in two days to have um, them approve the distribution plans and the schedule as well. Um, so going forward after that, what we're anticipating is that uh, here we are already almost mid-August. We are looking at somewhere around late August or early September to build out the formula and the competitive or the RFP applications in Smart Simple so that we can go ahead and get those materials released so that uh, applicants can start the process. Prior to us uh, starting the meeting today, we actually met with uh, the individual that's going to help us build these items out in Smart Simple. So we're already starting to sort of schedule and plan the logistics around that. Um, the other item for mid-September is that, uh, and I think this was an original suggestion by our chair, Chris Schreiber, is to put together um, some type of a convening, a virtual convening, um, so that we can get all potential applicants together on a Zoom call to talk about uh, this $31 million in funding, offer an opportunity to answer any questions about the program, and then also promote I guess uh, the opportunity for organizations to potentially collaborate together if they felt that that was appropriate. And also equally importantly, to make sure that there aren't a lot of duplications of efforts and projects so that we can sort of fully maximize the value of the $31 million. So uh, we floated some dates uh, earlier part of this week. And uh, I think right now we're, we're kind of targeting September 16th for that. Uh, 9 a.m. to noon. But once we finalize that, we'll go ahead and get that out to all of you and then also start building out the agenda and the specific discussion items for that. Uh, we're envisioning sometime in early October for the applications uh, to be due back to us. And right now, uh, the thinking is that the formula application will probably have uh, due a little bit earlier than the RFP since the RFP, there's, it, it's a little bit more of a detailed involved application and it'll also allow staff to sort of stagger our uh, review period for both the formula and the RFP tranches. Um, and then related to that, we'll go ahead and establish working groups comprised of uh, both committee members as well as staff in the review of primarily the competitive RFP applications, which will then lead to recommendations or funding recommendations 
uh, sometime in early November. And then uh, we think that sometime in late November, perhaps an ad hoc meeting in December, we'll go to the full commission with the committee's recommendations on the funding. And if everything goes as planned, what we're hoping for is that the funds will get dispersed starting in January of 2021. So we're, we're roughly about talking five months away from, from that end goal date. And just to note that the, the bulk of um, the committee members' work is gonna be um, in October for reviewing the application. Uh, this is Rich, a uh, question. Uh, have we received evaluations from the initial recipients of the $20 million grants? Uh, and if not, when do you expect them to come in? And how would you use those in uh, preparing for the $31 million grant round? Um, unfortunately, the timing of both grants are such that we, we don't have evaluations back. The, the only, what I'll put under the evaluation umbrella is that we will have the, uh, the spend down activity as we discussed earlier in uh, sometime in October or November. But in terms of specific programmatic evaluations, those uh, right now aren't scheduled to be uh, submitted by the programs until after June 30, 21, which is the end of the grant period. Just to hone in on the timing though, um, Duan just said the heavy lifting will be done in October. The spending reports are now due in the end of October? That is correct. So we probably won't have the spending reports by the time during the period when we're actually evaluating the, the proposals. Is that right? You're, you're not going to have it. Um, you, you have it um, midway through, if that. Um, it, it won't. You'll have them before they get finalized. The, the recommendation from this committee goes to the commission, but you won't have it at the start of your review. This is Herman. Approximately how many applications would you look to receive? I was hoping you weren't going to ask that. Um, <laughs> because we were trying to sort of estimate that ourselves. Um, I can tell you that for the formula application of the original 20 million, we received an initial interest of I think about 84 organizations that said they would be interested in applying for the formula. And ultimately, um, six, 71. Uh, Christine, do you recall? I know that 63 were funded and there were about 66 that actually applied for the formula component. Um, for the RFP component, we had uh, 24, I believe, that submitted applications with, and I, I apologize, I don't have that in front of me, and I believe it was 18 organizations that ultimately got approved. So what we were trying to do is look in our crystal ball to see if we could try and anticipate in any sort of fashion. I mean, part of us said that in the current limited funding environment, we would expect to see more, but that's just a stab in the dark. Um, so if we wanted to use the, uh, the original 20 million as a baseline, it would be somewhere six, mid 60s uh, and 20s, uh, low 20s for the RFP. But the, the, formula, the formula application piece of it, um, what we'd like to suggest to the committee is that, you know, that, that, that application is very, um, very slim because we just need um, to verify that they have qualifying activities and they're currently I also funded grantees. So um, with your permission, um, we'd like to have um, staff just do a high level review. I mean, actually a detailed review and then we'll flag for you um, the ones that are more questionable for a closer review. And we think that's probably the most efficient instead of breaking up into working groups for that. With the RFP, then I think that we definitely um, should um, break out into working groups. So with that in mind, if we get between um, 20 and 40 applications, um, we have four groups. Um, each group will be responsible, um, I really think at most, uh, 10 or 12 applications. So um, I think it's very doable, um, having gone through the bank grants, and I know a lot of members on this committee were on the bank grant, that that's roughly what you reviewed um, on the bank grant side. So this, that kind of raises a question though. I, I see that no minimum amount was the decision, was the, was the proposal. Given how stretched thin staff are right now, um, is it worth revisiting that and, and thinking if there should be a minimum dollar amount before it's worth the time for all of the processing? I'm, I'm happy to discuss that further. I, I can't recall, I, I think I did mention in the memo that there was not sort of unanimous 
consent on that particular issue. So that goes to, I think, the fourth agenda item. But yes, happy to talk about whether it makes sense to put in a minimum or a maximum. Do you I want to talk about it now, or should we wait? Well, t I, this is Chris. Two things. One is I do recall the working group really didn't talk so much about the minimum. We spent a lot more time talking about the maximum. So I, I hear your concern. Uh, Corey, I guess one thing I'd say is we probably do have some experience in, in what a minimum might be in the sense that we're likely not to get, you know, $5,000 grant applications from programs, right? It's, it'll be a cost benefit analysis for them. So the maximum is probably where we want to spend more time, but happy to talk about both. The second thing though, is that it does seem to me that we are, that we should tie in the discussion of the demand and the number of applications with how we, what comes out of the convening and what this, you know, what the groups, uh, what this committee sort of decides and how this is messaged out to the community um, by a lack and, and others. So I do think we, could actually inspire more demand than we've seen historically. That's more money on the table. And I'm hopeful that we're gonna get some innovative ideas. So I, I guess we might be a, a, in this respect, a victim of our own success. Well, I mean, if we did wanna do some kind of minimum, I guess the question would be for staff, one, is that likely to save you any actual time? And then, but it seems like you could set it somewhere like one half time attorney worth or something like that. And I mean, it seems that we are, and below that, we're not really contributing that much of value. And I, I understand most programs are not bothering to jump through the hoops for $5,000, but there, it seems like that does happen occasionally. And, um, and that, you know, it, it's really not worth it if the money isn't actually going to end up with some personnel or some other um, valuable service resulting from it. Uh, Bonache had a comment. Yes, thank you. Um, just uh, stepping off of the, the spirit from where Corey is speaking from right now, you know, from a project management perspective, I'm just, I'm looking at this timeline and I'm thinking of some of the other timelines that we have in the office that Eric also mentioned. And it, I would be keen <clears throat> to see what does this actually mean vis-a-vis -vis everything, all the other moving pieces. So when we're talking about October is a heavy lift, um, you know, my first, my first thought is, what are what is the staff going to need to be able to get through it with all of the other applications and everything else that's going on in the office what are you going to need so if if there is a, a minimum conversation if that helps let's give that to you what do you need to be able to get through because this is one timeline on one issue before the office yes um yeah, so that's, it's a comment and I guess also a caution. Um, yeah, so, so I think um, what that means is that the, the working group members um, for each working group, um, if you can be responsive um, to emails and um, do your part in reviewing your set timely um, and showing up um, to the, the conference calls and being um, engaged and, you know, present, um, that, that's what we need <laughs> to move things along in a timely manner. Well, I appreciate that. I just, I, honestly, where my concern is, is, is back on you all. Um, so maybe there's, there's some way we could start looking at a, an office wide calendar of events, because this, this seems doable just, you know, if it's just a, a snapshot uh, related to these grants, but there, 
there's much more in the pipeline. So the other thing that we're going to be moving in October, if, if you want to know, for the, uh, at least on the grant side, um, is we're going to be reviewing IELTS and EF um, budget applications, um, which are not as technical as the, the eligibility applications. Um, and most of our staff have, have, has done that. Um, what's going to happen on, on the staffing side for this particular grant is that um, the staffing will be uh, Christine, Eric, um, myself, and um, Dan. Um, and then on the budget side for IELTS and EF, um, both uh, Christine, Greg, and Dan will have less budgets to do. So, um, you know, we, we will try to balance the workload for the existing staff. And I would just add, Banafshe, and, and I appreciate your uh, feedback and your concern, is that the, the second to the last item, the ad hoc meeting or later, that was inserted after staff's discussion about how the sort of uh, the timing is going to work on this. Because, I mean, we, we did share some similar concerns about just uh, providing adequate time to the entire process. So uh, initially we had talked about trying to get all of this done by mid-November-ish, but we wanted to leave ourselves an out um, in case things got a little bit hairier than we thought um, so that we can uh, schedule an ad hoc meeting in December if we needed to. I think the other constraint is that I know, uh, you know, the last item is January 2021, funds dispersed. Um, we had talked about the possibility of possibly dispersing funds at a later date, perhaps in the first quarter. And unfortunately, uh, sort of doing this grant on a cycle uh, unrelated to our annual grant cycle causes some problems. So on the one hand, while we say we'd save some time by trying to push this out a few months, I think that causes some other problems that uh, are more problematic. So going back to the minimum and maximum, I mean, if, if you guys are okay and the commission is okay with the kind of estimated workload, let's get back to that. I, I forget. So there's no minimum now. Is is there a maximum? I, I read these materials, but I don't remember if it. Should it we wait that. to get to that those discussion points um, after we finish up the timeline? Oh sure, okay. Right. And then Kim, yes. did you have a comment about the timeline or about the min max? I, I think you're on mute, Kim. Um, it relate it relates to the minimum maximum. So okay. let's hold it. Great, thank you. Are there any other comments, questions on the proposed timeline? If not, I'd entertain a motion to uh, have the committee approve the proposed timeline. So moved. Okay, Richard Ryan is moved. Do we have a second? I'll, I'll second. Okay, Eric is seconded. I will take roll call. Chris Schreiber? Yes. Banashe Aklagi? Yes. Amin Al Saraf is absent. Herman DeBose? Yes. Corey Friedman? Yes. Eric Iskin? Yes. Jim Meeker? Yes. Richard Ryan is? Yes. Kim Savage? Yes. Okay, thank you, motion passes. Okay, Christine, if you can go back one slide, actually back one, I think, just to set the next conversation up. So item D, now we're getting into the weeds. Uh, as part of your meeting materials, we included two documents, uh, what we're referring to as the application for the formula tranche, as well as the RFP tranche of the $31 million funding. Uh, Christine, if we can move ahead to. Um, so as part of the process for us in putting together those materials, as we started uh, working on that process, um, we had a number of, we being staff had a number of questions and what we call sort of decision points which are highlighted uh, on this particular slide, six sort of key items. And uh, number three is what we just talked about. So I think we can start getting into the detail. Uh, so I'll just quickly go over this. This was also in the memo that uh, was put together. So the first question uh, decision point was the, uh, the bill language refresh, uh, referencing soon as practicable in terms of releasing the grant funds. Uh, we, we were trying to get some more granularity around exactly what that meant. Unfortunately, there really wasn't more guidance in terms of specifics. So, you know, based on the uh, discussions and the feedback that we received from the early groups that we talked about, we ultimately landed on the January 2021 
um, disbursement date, and I, I don't think there were any sort of concerns uh, or arguments about whether that would uh, fulfill the as soon as practicable language. So that's how we ultimately arrived at that. Um, number two, and please feel free to stop me if there are any comments or questions. Um, number two, the grant term and the distribution plan. Um, we had talked about, uh, well, stepping back for a second, the original $20 million homelessness prevention fund, that was roughly about an 18-month grant cycle, and that was pretty much sort of stipulated to us. Um, but unlike that, I think there was some more flexibility with respect to this $31 million. And just given other grants in history, we had, uh, we being staff had talked about potential two to four year sort of grant term. Uh, and we had floated that sort of wide range. And uh, ultimately the feedback that we got was that three years would be an appropriate grant term. And that the ultimately the granted amount would be divided equally uh, within that three-year cycle. So for an organization receiving $300,000, for instance, they would receive $100,000 per year as long as they meet specific re uh, requirements as far as reporting back status and that type of thing. Uh, number three, uh, maximum. Ray, can I, sorry, can I just make one comment? I, I did receive um, two calls from um, programs um, saying, uh, wanting me to pass along to this committee um, that they thought a one-year um, grant cycle, um, one-year grant term um, was the most prudent because um, then we can go back to the legislature and at the end of next year and ask for more instead of waiting three years. So, so I did want to bring that to your attention, even though the staff recommendation, the working recommendation is three years. But I did want to note, note that. Thanks, Dwan. Uh, so number three, uh, what we were talking about, minimum or maximum grant award, uh, specifically for the competitive grant. So obviously for the formula, uh, well, I don't know if it's obvious, there's a minimum $50,000 and then no maximum is just based on the formula, right? So it's relatively straightforward. Now for the competitive portion, uh, the original $20 million HP fund did not have a minimum nor maximum, right or wrong, that was uh, how that was approached. Um, and I guess at this point, I will open it up uh, to comments, discussions about whether we want to uh, impose some type of a min-max on the competitive portion. So um, having been on the banks uh, committee, subcommittee since the onset, I think a, uh, a maximum grant award is um, helpful. And I think it's helpful to staff. I think it's helpful to programs. Um, I don't see the need for a minimum, but I think we should lay out some parameters. I think it makes it easier to uh, make a decision. And then if there's tweaking of budgets, my guess is that it might be a little bit easier for staff. So that's, that's my view on it. I know when uh, Chris and um, Jim looked at this issue, I think they wanted to leave it wide open. Um, so I'd be interested in knowing what others want to do. What was the range of awards for the competitive grant uh, uh, proposals uh, in the last round with the 20 million? I'm going off the top of my head, Eric, but I believe on the low end we had seven, 75,000 and on the high end we had 1.4, which was a um, collaboration between multiple organizations. How did you come into those numbers, 75 and 1.4? Um, to be honest with you, I mean, there was no secret sauce on that. Um, the, the applicants came in with their sort of um, ask in terms of uh, the funding that they were seeking. They supported that ask um, with the program details in their application. And ultimately, staff looked at the ask relative to how many organizations applied. Um, I will tell you that with the $5 million that was available to be dispersed, I believe we had applications requesting 8.3 million, if I recall. So clearly there had to be a culling down process. So that was, that went into the evaluation. So depending on what organizations asked for, the quality of the programs that they were proposing, uh, we sort of, it was a little bit of a puzzle, if you will, in terms of um, 
reducing some, some uh, asks, um, funding others, not funding weaker sort of proposals, et cetera. Uh, to my, let me ask, to my colleagues who participated in programs of this nature, what is, what is the minimum amount that an organization can receive to make the grant worthwhile for what it is that they want to do? That's a really difficult um, question, Herman, because I think it's, it's really specific to the, the project. Um, you know, you have just some projects, the scale is much larger and some that um, can be done um, with half an FTE um, and some that you, you can't, they can't do without less than because it's a collaboration and it's, you know, uh, across the state. Um, so I think it really is case specific. Um, with that said, though, you know, we've used 50,000 as a minimum with um, this formula application as well as banks, um, and that, that seemed to be um, allow them to, you know, onboard um, somewhat of a half an FTE. It won't allow for full FTE with benefits, but, um, you know, a half FTE. We have in the competitive grant um, allocation about uh, $7 million, 7.3. Um, and 20 to 25 um, applicants was uh, the number that I heard before as it related to the competitive component of the $20 million grants. That would indicate an average of about 300,000, which would be 100,000 a year if the competitive grants are meted out equally over a three-year program. And 100,000 barely covers an FTE with benefits. Yeah, I would say I would, I would say a, a reasonable amount would be half full time with benefits. I, although I, how much that is, I don't I don't know whether it's fifty seventy five, probably more like seventy five. Um, but I I think for Rich's comment, it it might make sense to. I mean, p people aren't really asking for that much smaller, but it, it may set a range that save some time initially as programs look at that and say, oh, well, I don't, I can't really absorb another staff person, so I'm not going to bother. It, I don't know that it saves any time for staff um, after the applications are in or if it actually reduces the number, but it seems like it would, it would have a little bit more initial transparency, but it probably doesn't sound, doesn't sound like it makes a huge number, a huge amount of difference in terms of staff time from, from what I'm hearing. Um, what kind, what, so what would be, Kim, you talked about maximums. What, what, what would that mean here as far as numbers go? I, I'm having a hard time picturing a number. I don't know. When I hear Rich's numbers, it's, it's not a lot, you know, if, if we, are thinking there may be about, you know, it's like 20, 20 awards at 300,000 over a three year period. It's not a lot. Um, yeah. Uh, I mean, I, I would defer to staff on what they think a reasonable maximum would wanna be. And, and I'm, I'm really just, I, I view it as, you know, laying out some parameters to make the process to both be realistic about the amount of funds that are there and also to make the process maybe a little easier to handle. So, so I think you'd like to get, sorry, go ahead, Chris. So I guess I just would, one thing about the working group uh, process, so two things. One is that there is no right answer here. We just need to make a decision. I think we should be tried try to be guided by a principle which, and maybe it's a, a twin principle or the same side of the, or opposite sides of the same coin. One is we wanna make it easier on uh, programs to create the, uh, to, to create the, you know, the, the, the project that they're trying to fund. And, and so parameters to Kim's point, helps do that potentially the other side is that you know whatever we can do to sort of streamline the process for staff uh, so those are the principles that I think should guide the decision making when we were in the working group process though 
I do think that the size of the grants made it difficult to sort of establish a, uh, an upper end because as Greg mentioned, you know, 1.4 million is the top end. Now that's a joint project, but I'm not sure, at least this is was my thinking. I'm not sure how helpful it is to say that the that the maximum is, you know, 250 if we're gonna foreclose projects that are much larger, not better. Um, the other reason why I guess I would advocate, even though I'm generally sympathetic and in agreement with Kim's uh, point, I'm gonna raise the, the convening issue at this stage. So Greg, forgive me if I'm jumping ahead a little bit. No worries. Um, but I, the, the thing that I'd like the committee to take away is this idea that, and again, this is, I'm speaking purely it, personal opinion. I don't think this money is uh, best public policy in the following respect. We're asking legal services organizations to intervene very late stage, very downstream. And our experience with this prior uh, distribution of money is that we were seeing some repetition in the programs in terms of how they were spending the money. And I think with this, what we're trying to figure out is how to privilege and prioritize innovative programs and projects that will deploy <laughs> legal aid resources a little bit more creatively and in a way that maybe they are not doing right now. Like as I see it, and again, this is just my opinion, the UD process doesn't solve homelessness. It doesn't, it, it delays it, but like where legal aid can sort of intervene at this stage, it's, it's too late stage. So, you know, that's just a personal frustration about the public policy involved. I guess I, all of this is to say that the convening is, at least it's my hope that we will actually sort of inspire and create some innovation here. And I think it's really important in this regard to say to programs, look, if you wanna take a very ambitious approach here and figure out something completely new and you need a million dollars to do it, I, I guess I'm, I'm at least open to the idea of funding fewer programs with more money on something that is truly novel and might actually do something beyond what we've seen in the past, Know Your Rights, UD, um, counseling, mediation. And so that's that was ultimately my thinking in terms of why I didn't wanna set a maximum. I, I don't mean to speak for anybody else, um, but that was, that was what motivated me. And again, I'm generally sympathetic to the idea that the decision fatigue is real um, for the programs, but I'm crossing my fingers that we come up with something, you know, really new and exciting. Chris, if I may ask, can you put that in an RFP, what you just said? Can you write, <laughs> can you write an RFP to that effect? Well, there, a little bit. It, I mean, the RFP I would hope would be like, again, and so I've reached out to my contacts in the housing and affordable housing community. I think it's very, I'm frustrated on this, um, Herman, because I, ha I haven't heard great ideas from them either because of where legal services can actually intervene in the process. And so, you know, so, but I'm hoping, you know, there are a lot of much smarter people with a lot more expertise than me and I'm hopeful that, you know, if they get together and start brainstorming and they come up with a big project and they say something like, you know what, we could, we could do a three-year project between 
three organizations, but it's going to cost, you know, two and a half million dollars. Um, we might, you know, we would consider that. So anyway, that's my thinking. Yeah. I like what you have to say. The thing I says, how, how do you put that on paper to have someone who is creative to do what you've said you think should be done? Uh, Herman, uh, I was on the working group, and I agree with Chris. One of the ideas I was interested in is something more than just UD work. I think you can put it in the RFP, at least in the scoring rubric. You could give certain points for programs that are not doing traditional UD work. Uh, some of the stuff I had in mind, like where the programs go after cities and their housing elements to make sure they ensure more low-income housing and their housing elements is something different than a typical UD. But I do think we could give them preference in terms of the scoring rubric. And I'm going to interrupt. Uh, Banafshe had a comment, actually a slight suggestion. I'm going to put Bonnie and Selena on the spot and ask if they might have any uh, comments or feedback with respect to the min-max issue. Bonnie, do you want to go first? Sure. Go ahead, Selena. Hey, sure. I'll show myself, although you will now see my cat. Um, <laughs> Um, yeah, I mean, I think that it's it's hard to say what will be easiest both for staff and for programs. I think that um, you know, the larger the grant um, per program, that the more they'll be able to do with it because they, they'll be able to hire people rather than have a part of a person. Um, and I also am concerned, I think that Corey said earlier, that some programs may apply for a you know $5,000 grant. I don't think that that's that likely in our community, but I think that it wouldn't be worth staff's time to process a bunch of smaller grants. So um, I think you just have to figure out what would be the best minimum amount um, to not waste staff resources. Um, and then whatever maximum amount, you don't have to give the maximum award, that's just the maximum amount that could be applied for. So you could weigh all of the proposals and figure out how to, how to um, you know, allocate based on that. Sorry, here's my cat. Yeah, and I guess I'd say I would be fine without having a maximum amount. I think this is a time for bold solutions. I think this is a time for creativity. And um, I think there are things that would be really helpful. I mean, we have a really wide range with Shriver, frankly. Um, and um, I don't know. I mean, I... I, I I think it is. I think it really is hard. We have a lot of programs that are not, um, well, clearly lots of people now we're doing more education about rights, but um, we have many programs that help people before the UD is actually filed, um, when the notice is given, things like that. And, and, you know, frankly, from a legal perspective, you can do a whole lot more at that point in terms of negotiating and working things out and um, and which I suspect, we don't have any documentation, but I suspect also saves money in the long run in terms of litigation costs, other kinds of things. But um, I don't know. I mean, I can imagine some really, you know, it would be lovely, honestly, to see the possibility of people doing something big and creative, but. Uh, Corey, you had a comment? Yeah, so I, I I agree with Bonnie and Chris that I, I don't think we need to worry about um, a, a maximum. I think we want to preserve discretion until we see what we've got. Um, but I, I do think that Chris's overall philosophy is included in the rubric, and we don't have that on our screen right now. I assume we'll get to it later. But, um, but the main sort of subjective category on it was um, innovation. I'm trying to think of the exact term here. Um, let's see here. Proposed services are unique and innovative. And actually, I was, I mean, I have more comments about the specific rubric when we get to it, but I would say that I think that should be described as being a goal, but that it should not in fact be the um, sole category or uh, that as to quality of the proposal. I think it should just be quality of the proposal because I think that 
innovative and new and broads and 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 um you know seeking broad change is really important but also right now there's just going to be a massive crisis and and that in fact just getting through the next three years is not necessarily a terrible goal and i could completely imagine programs just stating you know we think we can we need to staff up this much for the next three years in this particular way to deal with this particular crisis and maybe that's reasonable too and so i think that it's totally fine to push programs for that and to state in our written documents that we would like that but i i don't think it should be the um the description of the exclusive description of what we're looking at that it that um, unique and innovative isn't it's great, but we also just want to see good quality proposals. Sorry, I'm going to go to Chris and then to Richard. Yeah, so I, I mean, I offer this in the spirit of allyship with Corey, because you nothing that you're saying is wrong, but I want to, you know, use this faux conflict between us here to sort of tease out a direction for this committee and the communications to the organizations. So I'm gonna disagree with you a little bit. Um, I, I think, yes, we're in a crisis situation, but this, and, and yes, we're gonna get a surge. But I, as I see it, this is money that we haven't had. And if organizations are reacting with a mentality of, you know, staunch the bleeding exclusively with this new money, that, that is what they will do. And I'm not saying it's inappropriate because it's certainly what will need to be done. But I, I just think we, we've got to move beyond what isn't working um, as a solution for, you know, the bigger picture solution. So I really feel strongly that, you know, a big, bold idea is far, you know, more important with this new money. And that might mean we fund two projects that are, you know, massive in scope um, relative to what we've funded in the past. I, I'm not suggesting that we will. I'm suggesting that I'm open to it. And I wanted to react to the comment that Juan made about a program saying, you know, a one year spend is better. I, I, I don't agree with that. And I guess I would push back on that program. I get the motivation that, you know, if the money's all gone, we can go back and get more. And that, you know, really resonates with me on a regular basis. But here that, you know, the idea of having to spend money down in one year is itself a limiting way of potentially, anyway, um, of thinking about how this money could be spent. And what I'm saying is, if we've got like, what we would maybe in other circumstances or other times call a pilot project, but I, I'm talking, this is like a, a wish list kind of moment for me, as, as I see it. Like these programs with housing expertise can say, look, we have wanted to do the following litigation and it's like, you know, three lawyers and two paralegals and four years, um, which would be basically a game changer, but we've never been able to do it. That's- I'm just saying, let's see if they come to us with those proposals. So, you know, I when what goes in the rubric is what we're going to have to score. So I would say, have a description that says, this is in particular what we're looking for is things that will have some kind of sea change and we're willing to consider large scale proposals or wh whatever it says, but that we don't limit the discretion of the commission until we see what the proposals are. Because I do love the idea of a huge, you know, amazing proposal that's gonna um, you know, have a massive impact. 
but I think we need to see what people actually come up with and what they propose. And I, I think uh, I'm, I'm not willing to assume that I know what makes the most sense um, now more than ever. So, so like, let's encourage people to do that and then see and then decide. I just don't think we should tie our hands by saying that's the number we're going to give you. And if you have an amazing program, but it's not that innovative, you're going to get a bad score. I'm going to go to Richard now. Thanks, Greg. Uh, I just want to make certain that I'm reading the statute correctly, but if I'm not mistaken, the competitive component of these grants was aimed at rural and underserved communities, which seems a little bit strange since every community our people serve is, or every community seems underserved. But historically, the commission's been somewhat sensitive to the issue of urban versus rural. Uh, and it's, it's always interesting to go to the state bar and present what we've done and demonstrate what we've done in some of the smaller counties. Uh, and so I would keep an eye on this word rural uh, in particular when putting together language that would um, elicit RFPs uh, and maybe the innovation could be there. Uh, the, the, the problem and the way I heard it articulated by both Corey and Chris is that we have a huge urban problem. Um, and I couldn't agree more, we do. But uh, if we're going to comply with the statutory language, we have to keep our eye on the rural needs as well. Um, I'm gonna then go to Kim and then Banafshe afterwards. So, um, you know, I'm okay with no minimum, maximum, and kind of what Corey has said, you know, see what comes. And, you know, I, I really, agree with what uh, Christian's saying in terms of really encouraging innovation. I have to say, based on my experience working in a very large urban direct service program, and then working at a backup center, and I don't think this has changed that much. When a direct service QLSP engages in something really innovative. It's a very long term process and I can just use the series of cases that Lafla did by Gary Blasey of challenging systemically and systematically the general leaf system. Okay, this went on to close to a decade and the result was incredible. But that's really atypical of the programs we're funding. And the real innovation, I think, ends up coming from the support centers because they're not overwhelmed by all the clients sitting in the lobby waiting to be seen or calling in. So as much as I don't want to dampen Christian's optimism for innovation, it's very, very difficult when you're in those offices, in my opinion. You're just overwhelmed by clients and the just front burner fires that are going on. And now there's more than ever. So I want to, you know, I'm fully in favor of encouraging that and trying to cultivate that because see, I see a ton of gaps between uh, the housing development community and the legal aid programs. I think we need to be realistic about what we're going to get. Um, and and see what and see what see what comes in. So that's just you know my my perspective. I'm happy to go along with the no minimum, no maximum, but I do think we need to be realistic. It's the the task for them is is overwhelming in the in the uh, direct service offices. Kim, I to, I totally agree, but it seems to me that if we are communicating out a message that, you know, look, here's $200,000. That's a front burner number. I mean, Gary Blasey, who was my, one of my law school professors and is amazing. Like that level of ambition is like sort of my point. Like if you're going to have $200,000, yeah, you can sort of reallocate resources and rearrange the deck chairs. You know, but if you have like two million, you're like you you hire a project manager to 
to go out and like find lawyers to do long-term project work or at least get it started. So I don't know, I'm, I'm, I, I totally agree with what you just said. And I don't wanna be a Pollyanna, but please let there be some innovation. Well, if, you've, if you had Gary as a professor, you're not a Pollyanna. <laughs> Uh, Banafche has been waiting. I'm going to go to you, Banafche. Uh, mine is really quick. I just, uh, underscoring what Rich said, I wanted to bring our attention back to rural. Um, and then, you know, uh, maybe mediating this faux disagreement that's taking place. Um, I wonder if there's some uh, hybrid that we could look at. Because I, I, I'm in agreement with Corey and Kim. The um, We have no idea the the onslaught of things and and i agree with you as well <laughs> christian that could there be something that could be done so that it's um not just putting fingers in the dam so uh if there's a, a hybrid model potentially but that was that was it I'll ask for any hybrid suggestions, but I think I'll echo what Kim said. I think she said that she would be okay with no minimum, no maximum. Can I make a suggestion? Um, we, we could add a paragraph um, trying to summarize um, how what Chris said, you know, he said it very articulately about trying to inspire um, innovation and creativity and perhaps tweak the scoring rubric to not as a category, but maybe that's bonus points but not, not a separate cat, like, you know, like a required category. I mean, there's a way to send a signal and then build it into. I defer to Jim Meeker on this. Ooh. I don't know, Jim, is that, yeah. Maximum discretion is what I think. See what we get, maximum, maximize discretion to consider, consider it. Yeah, I don't, I think you need to add it as bonus points. We can work it in the rubric, but again, we don't know what we're going to get till we get it. I mean, the bulk of this money is going to the, by formula is going to go for the normal UD stuff. That's the bulk. I agree with Chris that this is the minority of the, the money. And if there is innovative stuff, if there is groundbreaking stuff that's going to be new and perhaps start ideas for other programs, then we can wait them. But we don't know what we're going to get. We may just get routine stuff on this on this proposal. Um, so then in the spirit of moving things along, I'm going to suggest that we don't apply a minimum or maximum, but we will be speaking uh, about the rubric a little bit later. So to the extent that we want to somehow adjust that, uh, <clears throat> and certainly in that conversation. Okay. Um, I will move on to item number four on this slide. Uh, it's a little bit broad and cryptic, perhaps. Receipt of formula and RFP grants. Uh, what, I, what we were trying to uh, describe there was whether a program receiving a formula grant should impact uh, the decision about them receiving a competitive grant. And uh, I believe the feedback from the working group is that no, there shouldn't be sort of a black and white requirement or uh, 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 stipulation about that, but that it could be a point of consideration um, so that if organization A received uh, some formula funds, but their competitive grant was just identical as three others, that might impact whether they received the RFP component uh, versus some of the other funds. Um, Moving on to number five, allowance for subgranting. Once again, staying on the topic of uh, sort of um, uh, suggesting innovative proposals and projects, um, I, I think the working group was suggesting that uh, subgranting would be allowed both to IOLTA funded as well as non IOLTA funded organizations, as long as the uh, applicant is uh, descriptive in terms of how that subgrantee would weave into the overall program and provide beneficial services as a result. Um, and then the final item on here, uh, I think we touched on it slightly, but um, did the committee want to offer sort of any specific guidance in terms of proposals that are coming from QLSPs versus support centers? Um, and, 
and I think the the decision was no, nothing specific as far as putting it into the application, but that this would be probably a right topic for the the convening, uh, just to see if uh, we can get uh, thoughts from the QLSB and the support center uh, community on that. Um, so those were the main discussion items. Before we move from this slide, any questions, comments, feedback? I have a question for Chris. Um, I'm excited about what you're saying. Do you have any examples or have you read anything about people doing the creative type work that you're talking about? Is there something we could possibly read or to, to have some idea when staff begins to put the proposal together that some of those comments in the proposal could relate to what it's out there that's working as you so eloquently discuss. Uh, in terms of reading, I, I mean, nothing is jumping to mind. What I would say a couple of thoughts in response. One is that, you know, this, our, our experience spending both bank grant money and this first round of HP funding is um, I think instructive because of the sub-granting process, which is of course not unusual in other realms, but I think at least in my experience was a little bit newer in terms of how we tended to give away our money. Um, what I think it did was it opened the door to partner with non-IOLTA um, eligible uh, organizations that may have had expertise, number one. And then number two, I think what it did was it encouraged partnership between um, some of the legal services organizations that is a little bit unusual. So, uh, so I, I don't, you know, I, at least the way I've been trying to think about it is about how we want to message everything to the community, which is uh, for better or worse, and I think often for worse, and Selena, I'd encourage your reaction to this. You know, there is this sense of territoriality in the community for understandable reasons, right? People are worried about cannibalizing donors, donor fatigue, um, and, and as a result, you know, there's sort of regional and issue area expertise. And I think like this moment is something that when we communicate this at the convening, what we wanna say is, look, you guys know each other. You know where your, you know, where your various expertise and geographic divisions lie but let's see if we can sort of build this web like a little neural network in a way that might be a little bit unusual, but nevertheless um, is called for here. That's what I, I, I guess I, the most direct way to answer your question is that I don't, I don't have a, anything other than just a, a vision about how I think it could go. And I'm hopeful that the community itself will just take the opportunity to say, let's, you know, let's think big and work across traditional boundary lines to, to you know, brainstorm a huge project or a big innovative project. Um, I, I'm, I'm hoping they will actually lead, but as everybody has made the point, uh, you know, we'll see what we see when it comes in. I'm just going to share a comment that uh, Richard Rhinus made as far as suggested reading. Uh, the title is Evicted by Matthew Desmond, D-E-S-N-O-N-D. -E um, and then, so before I move on to the next slide, uh, Dwan reminded me uh, of a topic that came up recently, and this has to do with uh, income screening for the uh, grantee organizations that received the original as well as uh, this upcoming uh, HP funding. So 
Staff's interpretation of the original $20 million was that because these organizations are IELTA funded organizations, that they would uh, be required to screen for 125% of federal poverty level as they do for their quote, regular work. Um, in, in the recent reading by Brady, um, and, and I, I don't believe Brady was involved in that initial discussion, but Brady's interpretation of the budget language is that there is no specific call out for having to screen for that 125% of FPL. Um, so I know Brady is on the call. I'm going to put you on the spot just in case I didn't uh, quote you correctly or if you had anything else to add, Brady. Yeah, maybe Brady can give us a summary, but we did confirm Brady's reading with Donna and, um, and her understanding was that um, there, there is not an income restriction. Um, so the staff interpretation um, was, was too restrictive last, last year. Yeah, I, I, I don't think there's much to say other than the budget language is in the uh, memo and there's nothing there about limiting by income. Obviously, um, these grantees will, will have to make um, a decision because uh, as they alter grantees, um, to the extent they are serving over income, that wouldn't be qualified expenditures. But, um, and I, Donna, who was involved with this, um, I think agrees that it makes sense that um, when we're talking about um, homelessness prevention, um, um, it's a problem that is not necessarily limited to, to our strict uh, definition of um, indigency. Brady, just a follow-up question. Um, if the um, commission decided to put a cap though, would they have authority given that um, the statute is silent? Say they wanted to say it's 200 or 300%? Uh, you know, clearly in the, um, in the, um, in the uh, competitive grant, um, definitely yes. Um, in the, um, in the formula allocation, um, you know, the, the only criterion is that it needs to fall into that subject matter, uh, in the first paragraph of the language, um, representing, um, I don't have it right in front of me, but re representing tenants and, and landlord tenant disputes, including, and then a very broad array of, uh, activities there. So, um, I would say no, although obviously there, there's, there's, there's some, some of it. Once again, it was not the most elegant uh, or, or clear drafting. So I think staff's takeaway from this recent development is that uh, we're going to put some communication together since really the, the previous guidance that we had provided to the original HP $20 million grantees was that uh, there would be this 125% of FPL restriction, um, but that obviously we need to, to change that guidance for the upcoming. Um, and Bonnie, did, did, did you have any comments? Yeah. Bonnie, we, we I'm, I'm this really surprised by this interpretation. So, um, I mean, I don't have issues with it, but it, I would have read it as saying that these are because of the equal access yeah. funding parameters. I read it as assuming those were those parameters that are, you know, under IELTA, but um, I really appreciate this, this information. It, it certainly changes my report, so. Uh, it was a, a very late development on Friday. Okay. We apologize for um, no problem. I'm just the entire team, but, um, you know, I, I was part of the, that conversation with both, um, I, I believe at the time, Bonnie and Helen and Greg, and I think we had all kind of interpreted that as IELTA um, so when Brady brought this up, um, it, it was actually pretty new. <laughs> a new okay, no worries. No, I, I, yeah, just, it would be helpful. Anyway, thank you for alerting me. Okay, then let's uh, move on to the next slide. Christine, if you could forward. Okay, so um, as I'd mentioned, we, we will talk about the rubric um, just so that we flesh that out and uh, incorporate any feedback that you have. Um, so staff's view, obviously there's two components of the funding, the formula, uh, as well as the competitive and very similar to the original uh, $20 million HP funding. Uh, the $31 million is divided into two tranches, 75% towards formula, 25% towards competitive. 
uh, minus the 5% in administrative fees. Um, the formula component, as I think we've described and as you've probably seen in the materials, is uh, I, I think relatively speaking straightforward. Um, the uh, applicant applicants just needs to demonstrate that they're currently providing the services that are stipulated in the Budget Act. Obviously, they'll do that through Smart Simple. Um, staff will go ahead and review the applications and ensure that. Uh, you know, the information uh, that they're providing is accurate and vetted. And then we'll go ahead and run the formula as we would normally do. Uh, we are still sort of working out the specific logistics and the details um, with respect to Smart Simple and the applica application process. But like I said, uh, we think this is gonna be uh, fairly straightforward. And that's part of the reason why we think we're going to um, provide applicants with a little bit more time to submit the RFP applications versus the formula in Smart Simple. Any questions, comments on this? Um, Corey had a comment perhaps on our last conversation. I'll turn it over to you. That's okay, we've, we've moved on. Okay, gotcha. All right, so if there are no comments on the formula, let's move to the next one, which is the um, RFP application. Once again, you have the materials, and I should have led with um, the, the draft that you see in terms of the formula as well as the competitive application is largely modeled off the original same two applications for the $20 million funding. And once again, I think that just goes in line with the fact that um, the, the budget language as well as the requirements, it seems are almost identical, if not identical. Um, so we use the, the originals as sort of the model. Uh, for the competitive grant, um, you know, there are sort of key uh, components, the selection criteria, the scoring rubric, the application questions and the reporting requirements. Um, you know, the details are in the application. I don't know if there are any comments or feedback that you had on any of the components. If not, I, I think we thought that it, it might make some sense to talk a little bit about the scoring rubric, just to make sure that we're sort of all aligned in terms of what we're looking for there. Christine, do you wanna to go to the next one? Uh, the one after that, the one after that. <laughs> Okay, so here is the, um, the scoring rubric, which we basically lifted from the actual memo. Um, I can tell you that based on our conversation with Jim Meeker from a few weeks ago, where we uh, incorporated some of his feedback, I think the main change for those who were involved in the original $20 million RFP component is that we actually broke this out a little bit more. If you recall from the last rubric, there was one big uh, component called proposal quality, which I think had 45 points allocated to it. And underneath proposal quality, we had a number of sort of items that we were looking for. And uh, Jim's suggestion was that, um, why don't we go ahead and break that out a little bit more so that uh, applicants are, are, are more clear about what exactly it is that we're scoring and what are the ones that we think are important. Um, and then just sort of incorporating some of the earlier feedback. Actually, I, I won't speak for anybody. So you, so you see what's up on the screen. I'll just open this up. Um, Which were the components that, that were previously subsumed under quality? Um, proposed services rule, proposed service serve regardless of the time. I think what we did was um, the proposal quality, the first item, actually we sort of redistributed the points. So the first item was subsumed under the original, um, no, not historical, type and depth of partnership proposed service. You know, I don't want to speak out of turn. I'm, I don't know if Christine, do you have the old one that you might be able to pull up? Sorry, I'm putting you on the spot. So if we can table that one until um, we're able to. 
Actually, sorry, um, if Kim or Vicky can let Juan back into the meeting, um, that would be great. And then I'll stop sharing my screen for just a minute and I can pull up the, the old one. Okay. Greg, while she's doing that, could you give an example of what is meant by, let me pull it up since it's gone. Uh, proposed service are unique and innovative. I mean, what, is, what does that mean? I mean what's what's uh, unique and what's innovative? I think that is our sort of uh, less elegant way of saying what I think <laughs> Chris Schreiber had said earlier. So I think our takeaway is that we can certainly flesh that out a little bit more, a little bit better um, to incorporate what had been previously discussed. So whether we do that in the rubric, whether we do that in the document itself, we're totally open to that feedback. But the idea was, once again, to um, give organizations an opportunity to highlight programs that are beyond the, quote, traditional UD type work, that they're thinking sort of outside the box and proposing a program that is different, for lack of a better term. So I I can respond to that. I think we could say a couple things. One is, you know, is it unique to the organization? And I could imagine a couple ways in which it might be. So first, if they're partnering with new organizations or other legal services organizations, that might well be uh, unique and innovative. Two is whether any of the projects exist anywhere else in the state. So is this a a project that's modeled on something that exists, you know, in a different part of the state. Um, and then I think the third thing that comes sort of immediately to mind on this that we could, you know, identify or flesh out as a as an example is whether this is addressing uh, uh, heretofore or largely um, uh, unaddressed issue. Am I purple bike, Paul? In the uh, how can you the, can you get the purple bike out of the how do you get the purple bike out of the car? Buddy. Oh yeah, I know how. <laughs> um, which okay. is uh, I'm I'm so there, Brady. <laughs> I've got three in the background myself here. Uh, which is which is uh, for example, Jim Meeker's um. Uh, earlier example about housing element litigation, that would be an example of potentially uh, innovative um, program or project work that's not currently being done, maybe because precisely because they don't have the staffing to do it. So I would say anything that goes beyond the services currently being provided would sort of fall into that category. For example, if it's merely an expansion of existing services, I'd say that's not innovative or unique. Uh, but if it's something that the program doesn't do, isn't being done, or is otherwise uh, new, that would be unique and innovative. My thoughts. Thanks, Chris, for that feedback. We'll certainly incorporate that into that particular item. Um, Eric, to your earlier question, uh, Christine was able to pull up the old scoring rubric. So you'll see that the first item, which had a total point possible of 40 incorporated. So the type and depth of legal services provided, we broke that out. Uh, type and depth of partnerships, we broke that out. Uh, innovation, we broke that out as well. Maybe now if we can go back to the new rubric, just so that everybody's looking at the same thing. I actually say something about the old one. Oh, sorry. Before you, before you move back over, if I could just say something about the old one. Of course. Um, since not everyone on this group now was, um, was involved last time around, um, and the other people might have a different impression than me, but I thought one of the difficulties with the old scoring rubric was that historical performance and sustainability were not given that many points. Um, I mean, I, 
I have problems with a numerical way of doing this anyway, because it, I think it's just a balancing test, but um, that, that ship has sailed. So um, the, the issue with, with sustainability and historical performance is that most of the time it may not be all that significant, but if something really, really bad happened, you want it to be actually the deciding factor. And likewise, um, if someone didn't, if an organization's description of the proposal wasn't super duper, but they are um, a long established entity that has done consistent, awesome work, then you kind of wanted to be able to take that into consideration. So for the current rubric, we've still only got 10% organizational capacity and 10% historical performance. So my suggestion was to combine those since what you're really looking at is sort of what kind of organization is this and what, what do we know about it and are they going to actually be able to enact the proposal. So that gives um, the opportunity that if some, like if there's something his really bad that you want to take into consideration, it will actually affect the score because otherwise something really bad is not going to affect the score very much and you're just going to have to fund them. And then to, I would also in, increase that amount because I think taking type and depth of partnerships has been increased to 10 points and that, um, creates a little weird of incentive where programs that might not necessarily need a partner would want to go and get one just to get a better chance of being funded. And I, I think it's totally fine to have the subgrants, including non-IOLTA, but, um, but like we shouldn't necessarily be pressuring programs to do that. It, it just depends on the project, whether that makes sense. Or, and, and that a good project that has a partner isn't necessarily always a, better than one that doesn't have a partner. It really just depends on what they're doing. Um, and I think as Chris kind of suggested, that could be more like a factor in terms of innovation, where if someone's got um, a, a program that is very creative because it uses another organization to um, help with outreach or for whatever, then that could be considered in the overall quality of the proposal, but that you, it shouldn't get extra points. So then you could redistribute those points to organization and, and, um, and historical performance. Um, Cause I think the, the issue with making smaller pots and I really take Jim's point that it provides more clarity for the programs that we're looking for and that we should, we, it's helpful to them, but it really ties your hands so that if something is awesome in one category or something is terrible, it's not really gonna matter very much. Uh, whereas having a big pot of organizational stability and capacity and having a big pot of quality that covers a bunch of factors allows you when you're reviewing it to to take that to to take that all into consideration so that's that's my suggestion christine can we go to the new rubric i was just going to say I, I agree with corey's comment on the partnership piece i i had that reaction as well i'm not sure why we should penalize um, um an applicant just because they don't have a partner or, 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 or um, you know, give them comment, give them plus points for having one. Uh, I appreciate that feedback, and I think that makes a lot of sense. Uh, I'm just trying to figure out, just sort of practically speaking, then. So, Corey, if I heard you correctly, we should load that into another one so that it's not a separate item. Because you're absolutely right. I mean, if you don't have a partner, it doesn't mean your proposal is, quote, bad, right? Yeah, so, so per my previous suggestion, I would take the um, so if services are unique and innovative category and make it broader to proposal quality, which 
takes into consideration um, whether it's innovative or creative, whether it's thought out well, you know, whether um, it serves the needs of communities, just the overall, anything that you would want to throw into that category, but the, but the title isn't and unique and innovative because you're considering other things too. You're, you're also just, I mean, it can be unique and innovative and crappy if you want it to be unique and innovative and effective and, and efficient and all of that. And so um, you could note in there, as far as messaging that, um, you could you could do it as an example like chris gave a bunch of examples so maybe that's one of the examples and i think that shows i think actually examples are a really nice way of doing it because it, it maybe spurs ideas in people when they read it think oh you know oh there's just other people i could i could do but you're not ne exclusive you're not necessarily saying that's worth 10 points if you do it you're saying that these are these are some of the things that could um could be sources of ideas and one of them is to work with work with a, a new organization okay so we're obviously going to have to tweak this a little bit and play with the language but I, I think broadly what i'm hearing is actually sort of reverting back to the the old rubric that we had just sort of uh assign a bigger points to a broader category in this case proposal quality with more descriptive items underneath that Right, but I would also have overall just bigger categories because I think last time around history and sustainability were not given enough points. And I remember in the discussions that um, Chris and Bonashe and Eric and I had at the time, it was, it was, I mean, it's not a secret. We have some problems with children and we have also some organizations that are, you know, you can really rely on and, um, and, we want to be able to report to the legislature at the end of the day that we have that um, that that the following has actually been done and that that um, our requirements have been met and all of that and so um, making sure that segment is not so small that if they're that that it's not going to affect whether something gets funded or not because ten percent isn't going to affect it. Gotcha. Uh, Dwan, you had a comment? Jim has a, a comment. I just wanted to uh, make sure he's in the queue. Uh, yeah, I, I kind of agree with Corey, but my uh, solution to that would be put organizational capacity, uh, combine that with type and depth of partnership if they have a partnership. I agree they shouldn't be penalized if they don't have one, but if they do have one, that's, that's part of the idea that maybe they're doing this partnership to, do, to expand their capacity what they can't do on their own. I've got a couple of other points. One relates to what Rich brought up earlier on serving the rural communities. On the rubrics you have up there, it just says on number two, propose uh, to serve uh, rural or underserved communities. It's expanded a little bit more on the materials you gave us on page five. But the problem is all our communities that we serve by dent of the 125% of the poverty level are underserved. And so, that really doesn't distinguish the rural. I mean, I'm not sure what we mean by other underserved communities, maybe make unique underserved communities. Uh, I could see that you could have a unique underserved community that we might want to put on par with the rural communities. But right now, as, it, as it's written, I don't see how rural is any different from any other communities that are at 125% of the poverty level. The other one I had problems with reading it was the one saying um, uh, serving uh, uh, the third one uh, proposed services serve clients regardless of immigration or citizenship status. If I were scoring this, I mean, if I had a proposal that doesn't regard citizenship status at all or immigrant status, it seemed to me that would be the same level of points as you'd give an agency that specifically singles out immigration or citizenship status. So I, I really don't know how that rubric could be scored by uh, somebody that was judging the proposal. I think on that one, Jim, just to address the last point, is the, the legislative concern there that we understood from the first time was that this money shouldn't be spent on organizations that are prohibited from serving those communities. So I don't know that if you're targeting those communities, you get bonus points. But 
the view was that if you could not serve those communities because you were, for example, an LSC funded organization, then you, you really weren't going to get this money. Then maybe we should word it that way. That so, if you have immigration restrictions, then that's a low priority or exclusion. Th this was the comp. I I'm glad you brought this up, Jim, because this is why I was in the queue. I wanted to bring this up. Um, I mean, if this money, this money can be somehow segregated from the federal LSC money, I'm not sure if that's possible, but I mean, I wouldn't view this as a criteria. I, I would view it as a requirement. I mean, just a threshold requirement that you cannot discriminate on uh, someone's immigration or citizenship status. So, um, I just, I'm not comfortable with it in criteria. I think in sort of practical terms, the idea here was that it, it is in effect bonus points. So if you are an organization that has restrictions that you can't serve immigrants, for example, you wouldn't get these points. Now, so we're open to how to sort of restructure that, but I know that was the original intent on this. And so for, for someone to, to get a program to get 20 points on this, they would specifically have to call out, yeah, we, we have no restrictions on that. Uh, and we meet these criteria fully. Just a follow-up question. Does that mean, how about the bulk of the money that goes by formula? Does that mean that money can't go to LSC funded programs? That's not how we interpreted it. Um, I, no, it's, just, it's, a, it's a separate sub, it's, that language is only um, applies to the right. subparagraph of the 25%. Oh, okay, great. Richard, I don't want to forget you. You had a question. Yeah, it, it just related to the notion, and it's uh, prioritized in this rubric, or at least the way it's presented in the numerical value of it, the focus on innovation, which I applaud and I uh, agree is worthy, uh, is focusing on home runs. Uh, and I'm not uh, disposed to only focusing on home runs. The surge we talked about before requires singles and doubles. Uh, and while I think it's worthy to have innovative programs and to do what we can to encourage in this 25% sector innovative programs, I'm still interested in seeing that the, the initial surge is met, that the waterfall courts are predicting that will occur in eviction defense work. Uh, it's going to be dissipated over three years. Uh, initially, it's going to be enormous because of the uh, legislative uh, protections there have been for eviction. So we're gonna see this giant backlog and the courts are gonna be backed up for months, but not years. Over time, that will work its way down to a, 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 a level that's somewhat stable. Um, so the notion of each one of these grants being three years in equal amounts troubles me a little bit. The notion that we're looking for innovative programs is a good one, but I don't wanna overlook the immediate need for the grunt work that it's going to take to protect our most vulnerable community. Um, and I, I applaud the notion that it should be 25 points. And I do like the rubric a lot. It keeps all of us and all of our um, grantees on the same page. It, it provides a transparency for which we've been criticized in the past. So I like it from that perspective as well. That's it. Corey, I'm going to ask you to just uh, provide your comment orally. I think you're muted. Corey, you're muted. <laughs> okay, sorry. <laughs> uh, I just wrote that just so everyone knows because there are a bunch of rural pro counties served only by LSC funded programs, in some cases serving rural and serving undocumented will cancel each other out in terms of points. Uh, Jim, you had a comment? Uh, yeah, uh, a comment on, uh, on evaluation. We really don't have in any of the rubrics what I see is evaluation. Uh, my experience on the bank grant 
reviews, whereas I think out of all the programs I reviewed, there were only two that actually set aside money in their, their budget for evaluation of the effectiveness of their proposal uh, in terms of the innovations that they were introducing, whether or not they would work, whether or not they could be expanded to other programs, uh, what parts should be expanded, what parts should be improved upon, and so on. And I would like to see at least something worked into these different uh, rubric points on a program that would actually consciously look at an evaluation that goes beyond, we served X number of clients, um, we delivered X number of clinics, uh, and those kinds of things that we typically, typically got in the bank grants. Um, Can I respond to Jim really quick? Um, sure. so, so Jim, um, we have heard from programs that, um, you know, a lot of them do you want to engage in kind of more eval in-depth evaluation, but um, it is costly. So um, they have said to me that if the commission wants that, if, if they can get extra money, perhaps an additional ten, fifteen thousand dollars on top of you know to carve out for evaluations. So I'm I'm just kind of, kind of throwing out there because it is costly. I mean, we do have a, a set of reporting requirements uh, that we require um, these grantees to complete so that we can aggregate the data. Um, but if you want something above and beyond. Um, but yeah, but just be aware that it's costly for programs. Oh, yeah, I'm, I'm well aware. I mean, for every $10,000 you spend on evaluation, that's X number of clients you can't serve. And it's always a Faustian bargain in terms of how much you do an evaluation. And I do know we're collecting certain things, which I think will be helpful in terms of telling the legislature of what impact we've had with these monies. But still, as a social scientist anyway, I'm pleading for let's at least encourage evaluation to the effect that it, perhaps we could provide information for other programs in the future on what kind of innovative stuff works and what kind of, and more importantly, what kind of in innovative stuff does not work and why. Um, I, I'm going to sort of rein us back in a little bit in terms of process. So the, appreciate the feedback that you've all provided on the scoring rubric. Obviously we need to go back and sort of, tweak this a little bit and incorporate some of those comments. Uh, Dawn, I'm, I'm looking to you just in terms of process. Uh, obviously, Christina and I can do that. Um, do you suggest that we then somehow send it out to the entire group, to the working group? What, what do you think is the best? Uh, do, do we have consensus on some of these items? Because perhaps um, we, if you guys could just kind of quickly type in what the new scoring group would look like, we can um, wordsmith it after. Um, but then so we know we're on the same page. Because we, we do have to bring it to um, share with the commission on, on Friday. It, I, I was hearing consensus um, around some of the, maybe perhaps um, grouping them back together, or am I? Yeah, I sort of heard the same thing. And sorry, Christine, I don't know if you can pull up the old rubric, because I sort of heard that we were kind of migrating back towards that. Um, so proposal quality, um, just I, so Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. No, go ahead. I was going to say, I don't think you need to necessarily go back to the old one. I think, um, I think you could group it in different ways, but it, it kind of sounds like, um, um, type and depth of partnerships should, could be fit into a couple of different slots and then organizational capacity, historical performance, um, and maybe even potential sun sustainability, because it, it sounds like if the focus is on innovation, may maybe we care less about that. I don't know. I could go either way. <clears throat> could be grouped together. And then, um, and then I, I don't, I don't know I, if people are also want the Proposed services are unique in an innovative slash quality category to also to also include rural and underserved or immigration status or if people want that to be those to be broken out separately. So I, I guess the other we, we can answer Corey's that last question there and the other thought is um, perhaps um, we take a stab so we don't um, you know have to to waste everybody's time right now. Um, the staff and then and then circle back to uh, Corey and, and then the working group um, to see if that's appropriate. What we have is accurately reflected. This is Banafsha. I think that makes sense. Okay. Who, who is the working group? 
The working group was um, Chris, Jim, and Kim. Yeah, I'm happy deferring it to the working group, the rework. Okay, and that's what we'll do. Can I, can I make a comment about uh, sort of how we're going to apply whatever rubric we come up with? Um, I have some concerns, or maybe you have a, a thought about how we're going to try to ensure some consistency among the, among the various working groups in terms of how we apply whatever rubric we come up with. Um, and I, I've done these things before, and you know, you have one group that sort of thinks it's a 10, and, and another group will think the same thing as a 15. Um, I will quickly add that we had that same conversation with uh, Jim during our last talk with him about the rubric. Um, so I'll let him speak to the technical part of what he had suggested, but I think more broadly speaking, uh, what we hope to do is that before we actually get into the working groups, I think similar to what Corey has talked about, yes, we will have the final scoring rubric to use as a guide, but for each of the criteria, what we hope to, not what we hope, what we will provide is specific guidance that says for someone to get, for a program to get 40 points, they must demonstrate X, Y, and Z. For them to get 35, they would have mm -hmm. to do ABC, just so that hopefully we can get everybody a little bit more aligned. Um, but to your point, I think regardless of whether we do that, there will almost, there will probably have to be sort of iterations, right? Because you're absolutely right. I think one person can score something as a 35, the other person would see it as a 30, and we do need to somehow be able to come to some calibration so that one organization isn't being penalized, if you will, because they're being scored by you, Eric, versus by Corey, for instance. Mm -hmm. All right. Yeah, um, as I explained to uh, the people earlier, these things, at least my experience with the Department of Justice and looking at scoring rubrics for uh, proposals to the Justice Department, is that these things evolve over time. And that what you wanna do is look at these different categories and see how much variability there is. So let's say if on the, um, the rubric on they're unique and innovative with 25 points, let's see if that particular scoring rubric across five scores had the highest possible variance compared to any of the other rubrics. That would suggest that there's far more or less agreement on that particular category, which means it needs further refinement or discussion across the scores in terms of what it actually means to the different people, especially if one score gives it a one and another score gives it a 25. There's obviously vastly different disagreements across those two individuals. And the, inter and the important point is why? Why is there that level of disagreement? And in addition, there's a variability across scores, but then there's also variabilities across grants. So if you have one grant proposal that has an overall score of 80 and a variance of five, which means on average, the scores were five points apart on any one item, as opposed to another one that had an average score of 80 and a variance of 15, which means there's far more, far more disagreement that would suggest that the, the, the grant that got the 80 that had a variance of five would be preferable to fund because there's far more agreement, even though its total score was no different than the one that got 80, but it had a variance of 15. Does that make sense? Well, it, it does, but I'm just trying to think through how this is gonna work. I mean, I'm envisioning like in October, I'm gonna be in a working group that's gonna get 10 proposals <laughs> to evaluate. And we're gonna meet on October 10th, all right, making this up. And we're going to sit around and score these 10 proposals according to the rubric. And some other group is going to meet on October 12th, 13th, whatever. How are we going to do all this analysis and kind of get it, get it all done by whenever we have to get it done? It sounds like several iterations of meetings and going back. And, and I'm willing to do all that. I just want to be sure we understand how we're going to do it. Well, if you have group A that scores all of its grant proposals as 100, and you have group B that scores all its grant proposals as 25. Obviously, there's a difference between group A and B. Is that a function of the specific grants they got? Or is that a function of the scores? And yeah, I think that's something as a group we need to talk about. I mean, if it is really that group B got worse proposals and their lower score average justifies that, well, then that's fine. But if it turns out that if, grant, if group A would have got the same proposals as group B, and they would have scored them higher than group B, 
then that suggests that there's issues amongst the groups that needs to be settled in terms of them mm -hmm. scoring these things drastically different. And I think we did have that issue uh, on one reiteration on the grant proposals that I remember that there was one group, I think the group I was on scored everything very low compared to another group that scored everything high. And we had a discussion about that. And we also had a discussion about the staff who actually agreed with the differences that the staff was scoring all the proposals on my group low also. So in the end, we accepted those differences. It's just that my group got lousy proposals. <laughs> the other group got better proposals. But the staff was very important as sort of serving as an objective reality in terms of the quality differences amongst the groups. I don't know if this helps, but um, there will be some staff, including myself and perhaps both um, Christine and or Greg, that will review all of them. So if you have, you know, somewhat of trust in us, then we, we could be that equalizer for you to let you know if, uh, you know, from our perspective, if there is a particular grouping that has stronger or weaker applications. Um, and I mean, it's not a perfect system, but um, this is, you know, the go around. There, there was one iteration of bank grants um, that Kim was involved in at the very first where um, every single uh, commissioner in that, uh, that committee reviewed every single application and it was, um, it, it was not tenable. Um, remember, uh, Kim Herman. Um, so, so we, you know, we, we know we're going to sacrifice um, some precision, but um, to make it workable for you. If I can jump in really quick as well, um, Jim, you made a, a good point during our conversation last week, um, and this is something that we can do at the staff level: is we can calibrate between uh, the three of us to make sure that we are scoring similarly by, by looking at one grant proposal uh, first and see where, how we've scored it and then mm. kind of calibrate where, um, how we're giving out the, those points and get on the same page. So then when we go forward, we know that we're doing it in a similar fashion and, and can, that will help us with the working groups. Okay, can I have a question for Christian? Uh, Christian, are you still on? Yes. Okay. Looking at this new 40 points, does that incorporate what you had in mind in regards to unique and innovative? I think so. Okay. That's all. That's all. And, but just circling back, Eric, to your point. So I think it, it is uh, on the staff prior to the working groups getting together in October for us to sort of lay out what that process is going to look like. You know, the working groups will meet on October 10th, and then maybe there's going to be some type of a calibration meeting on the 13th, et cetera. So we'll have to flesh out those details and provide it to you just so that everybody's clear on what the process is going to look like. Okay. Thank you. Um, sure. Okay. So with that, Christine and I have uh, to do here in terms of refining this, uh, the scoring rubric, and then we'll get that out to the working group for its final review and approval. Um, if we can go to the motions, um, and then Dewan, if I misspeak on this, you can correct me, but I think the idea behind the, the motions is that uh, the committee is approving essentially in concept what we're proposing with respect to the timelines, as well as the application. There may very well be minor tweaks in terms of dates as we sort of refine those. Um, similarly, we've fielded some feedback and comments on the application itself, which we'll obviously incorporate. Um, but broadly speaking, we're asking for a motion um, for the committee to approve both the timeline that we had initially presented, as well as the applications for both formula and the competitive grant. And we just want to um, reiterate that it's really approving in concept um, because um, we, we'd like to uh, kind of work on uh, the, the, the language a little bit more, maybe um, fine tune some things, maybe perhaps um, add an additional paragraph or two um, uh, to, to go to what Chris said and, and maybe flesh out some examples. So that, that won't be the exact form, but in concept, everything substantively won't change. So with that, uh would entertain a motion on the, the two uh, resolutions here. So moved. I'm sorry, was that Chris? That was me, yeah. Okay. Do we have a second? Second. Sorry, was that uh, Richard Reynolds? Okay. I will take a roll call vote. So Chris Schreiber? Yes. Okay. Banafshe Aklagi? Yes. <laughs> 
Amin Al Saraf is absent. Herman DeVos? Yes. Corey Friedman? Yes. Eric Iskin? Yes. Jim Meeker? Yes. Richard Vinus? Yes. Luke Savage? Yes. Okay, the motion passes. And then I think there's perhaps one last slide, just sort of summarize next steps here. Um, as I had previously mentioned, uh, we will, <coughs> I think substantially the similar memo has been incorporated in the um, full commission meeting that will occur in two days and we'll ask the commission to approve effectively um, the resolutions that uh, were approved here today. Is that correct, Duan? Okay, got it. Um, and then, <coughs> as I had mentioned earlier, we had already talked to an individual who's going to help us build this, uh, these applications out in Smart Simple. Uh, we owe her a specific schedule in terms of how to go about doing that in light of our overall schedule to try and get this finalized by the end of this month. Um, we will work internally as well as with uh, other stakeholders on uh, fleshing out the convening session that we're talking about for mid-September and uh, put an agenda together for that uh, session. And then a little bit later down the road, we will go ahead and formally establish the various working groups. And obviously that will happen after the uh, applications start rolling in. Um, and I'm sorry Greg, to interrupt you. Um, I, you know, because I cut out my internet when, while we were talking about the um, income thresholds. Um, did we come to agreement or do we need to, to make a decision or was there consensus? That's a good point. I, I don't think there was a formal decision on that. Um, uh, so I, I guess I think the, I, I had asked Brady if the commission has authority um, to say perhaps um, uh, uh, put an upper bound to the and whether you you wanted to um, because I think that is an outstanding question at least just for the RFP portion my understanding from Brady is that the formula um, doesn't have any um, it, it's just the activities um, that are qualifying there aren't income would staff recommend the hundred and twenty five percent threshold or I mean I it seems like this is kind of a question that has been I think you said raised on Friday so maybe you don't have an answer to this but are you thinking um 125 or usual threshold or are you thinking the higher higher threshold like maybe what's used for for pro bono um I, I don't know we've had time to kind of really um have a staff recommendation i know that from uh donna she, i think she seemed to think that it made sense um to give some flexibility above the 125 but how how much i'm, I'm not sure um and i don't know if, there, if you don't have thoughts we, we could put a pin on that and um do a little bit more um research and um, perhaps reach out to bonnie too separately and selena um to, to maybe make a recommendation that we could bring forth to the whole commission I think that's a good idea, Duana. Okay. Um, one last point about the convening. Um, it, it, as Greg mentioned, go ahead. Sorry, if I jumped in. Oh no, no, that, that so that so so we'll 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 do that, and we'll we'll run it past you, Chris, before we present um, to the commission. Thank you. So one last point about the convening. So Greg mentioned that it's going to be in mid-September, date to TBD. Uh, but I guess I would really encourage the, uh, the committee members not only to give a lot of thought to, well, first of all, I hope everybody can uh, participate in some fashion. Second, I'd love it if people could give some thought, reach out to their contacts. The convening, as I, I don't know if we've mentioned it today, but the convening actually isn't going to be limited to legal services organizations or their representatives. It really is an opportunity for the housing community and the affordable housing community to come uh, participate. And that might mean we get some very uh, new voices into the mix. So if you have uh, friends, contacts, friends of friends that you feel like might be able to contribute ideas and thoughts about uh, about 
uh, homelessness prevention projects, then I would really encourage everybody to, to begin thinking about how to push, uh, push people into that convening so that we have a productive session and that it, it's as creative as it can be. Thank you, Chris. And we were planning to um, invite um, some of the participants um, that are, are, who are administering the other $300 million to get some type of um, coordination statewide going on. And perhaps, um, you know, we won't invite some of our external to the whole meeting, but there'll certainly be an opportunity uh, for some sessions will re involve uh, a larger community. You know, one place to, to think about uh, reaching out is to the legislative housing committee consultants. Um, there was a standing or a select committee on mobile home, um, uh, mobile home housing on the at least on the Senate side. I, I think there is an analogous subcommittee or standing committee on um, on the Assembly side, and you know the, those consultants will obviously. I, I think we should invite them, okay. and and then they're they're going to have quite a few people as well. You know. So anyway, I have some ideas we can talk about. Oh, that's yeah. great. Do, do, RF, do RFP applicants have to be 2020 IOLTA grantees? Formula um, applicants have to be uh, correct, right, um, Greg? But but are, um, I, competitive, they don't have to be current grantees. Hmm. But they have to be um, 2021 ap uh, grantees, right? Eligible for RFP portion? You're on mute, Greg. Sorry about that. That sounds right, Chris. I, I don't suppose you have that language, Christine, do you? Formula, I'm, I'm pretty sure it's current grantees and 20, and for uh, our, um, the other one, it's more flexible. So yeah, the, 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 the new grantees would be eligible um, yeah. Yeah. under the competitive grant. Gotcha. So the two new grantees that are um, to be determined on Friday could potentially mm -hmm. apply for the RFP, yeah. Okay, so I think that's uh, all we had in terms of the agenda. Are there any other thoughts, comments, questions? Okay, hearing none, uh, we really appreciate all of your feedback. We're giving you back uh, 35 minutes here. Uh, mm -hmm. Thank you for your time and um, I guess we'll adjourn yeah. now. Dawn and Christine, if you guys can just stick around for a few sure. more minutes. Sure. Hey, Greg, great, great job. Well well, thank, you. thank you. Thank you, everyone. Agreed, Greg, Christine, Juan, thank you. Thanks, thanks to everybody on the committee, too. Take care. Bye, everybody. Bye. Kim, Vicki, can we stay on for a little bit? Can you make Greg the host or? Uh, yeah, do you want me to stop recording this? Yeah, can you stop recording? Thank you. I forgot I wasn't the host. Bye, Brady. Bye. <laughs>
not all the programs, but the, you know, they really have their, 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 they're, they're waiting for this email for about HP funds. Okay. Well, that's good. Uh, no, because it's, fun, it's money, right? <laughs> no, absolutely. No. And I think that's a valid point because I, I think I, I kept hearing about the convening and talking about collaboration, but you're absolutely right. I, by the time mid September rolls around, that'll already be two weeks after the application has been released in theory. Yeah. Right? They, they need to know that like the commission is very open to funding very big projects. And it seems like, I mean, Chris is throwing around, um, $2 million. <laughs> I wonder, and I, again, you guys tell me if this is going to be too much because, you know, I like to hit the, you know, green light. I, I wonder if we should um, have some type of like, I don't want to call it convening or webinar, but maybe informational webinar because we could start sharing, just, just running through um, the timeline with them and the scoring rubric and then just saying again what Chris is saying, just as, as a preview of what is to come for, um, uh, you know, September. Potential guarantees. Yeah, so we release it on Friday and then maybe like um, the following um, week, the three of us can just get on something really, really casual, kind of like how um, Helen did with the IELTS distribution um, and just like very like, you know, an hour go through. I mean, we've, I mean, Greg and Christine, you guys have done this already so many times, like really just go through the timeline, um, go through the scoring rubric and then, and then just reiterate what Chris and everybody is saying and then be done. If it's too much, I won't ever speak it again. <laughs> um, well, now that you're throwing it out there, though. <laughs> um, I, I think that that might, um, doing, doing a, a webinar like that, uh, allowing them to ask questions, and then that being something that we can post might eliminate um, some of the questions we get later on, and also maybe potentially eliminate us having to do like a, a FAQ because we're doing it live and people can watch it. Um, well, and so then I actually thought the FAQ before was really good and we just need to tweak it a little bit and then we can just re, re, repost those FAQs. Yeah. Okay. Well, I mean, Christine and I also had on our list to uh, fine tune the schedule. So we'll, we'll see about trying to slot that into. Okay. Um, and again, or, 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 you know, I, I won't feel offended. You and Christine can talk about it and then just tell me no. <laughs> <laughs> But that's just my, was my initial thought. Um, anyways. Well, I mean, that's, uh, you know, my initial thought is that's a lot less work than a convening. Um, Cause we're just talking about programs that are really well, interesting. Well, we gotta do convening, but. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, I know. I'm just thinking that what yeah. you're proposing is, is pretty low pressure. Cause it's just um, people who are really interested and already have a question that they want to ask. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, because yeah, people, yeah, we're, gonna get, we're gonna get a lot of questions, even though you know I do I do support and concept and the no minimum maximum. We're gonna get questions like, but a million. What, what can we? What they need some guidance. So I think like I don't want to memorialize in a in the RFP, but then on a webinar, I think we could say, but well, you know, um, we can't speak on behalf of the commission. However, there was a commissioner that threw out an example um, that if you came with a really big project that had a lot of impact, um, he threw around the $1 million or $2 million. And this gives them a sense, right? Because if not, people are very shy about going to that number or not going to that number, you know, kind of a thing. And they need a little bit of guidance. And if not, we're going to have to just figure it out and then we're going to have to coordinate and then what's for the messaging. And I think it's a little bit more difficult. Um, but again, up, up to you guys. I leave it up to you guys. Um, so I guess let's go to the to-do list. Um, this, you guys will do the scoring rubric. Mm -hmm. um, that we need to probably turn around um, uh, so that we get something walking into the meeting on, on, on Friday that to share with the, with the group. Um, what, did we say we're gonna release a draft, right, of the, um, of the RFP next week? Yeah, I think the idea was based on the feedback from today and from the commission, we would send out hard copies of the applications to the programs just so that they can look at that and just sort of plan for it before it gets okay. really smart simple. I think that's what I heard. Okay, so if we can, if we can build in one more paragraph just about the innovation, um, you know, and we can float it by, by Chris, then I think that'll be ready to go. I was going to say maybe let's do examples, but I think that's ambitious and, and I think that's going to take up more time. So I think let's hold off on the examples. And if we do end up doing the webinar, maybe we just talk about the examples um, instead yeah, of writing. So we, I think we, that's had talked, we had talked about examples in the in the RFP and then we just didn't have enough time to get with. with and you know those examples of the bank grant one, 
Thank you. Stephanie and I did it, and it, it took quite a bit of time to find yeah. two to get really good examples. It's actually not. It, it was pretty hard. So I think at this juncture, let's just not do that to ourselves. But um, I, I think um, once we start talking to people, um, we keep a running list of examples, and that those are things that we can share out, like the housing element one. Um, you know, a bit really big. Um, uh, you know, um, impact litigation project. Um, that could be another example. We really should pick um, uh, Kim and 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 um, her brain and um, and Chris again. Because if we just we don't have to have an exhaustive list, but you know, I think four or five at our fingertips would be good. And we already have like three there. So. Okay. Sorry, what what date are we saying we have to send the hard copies to the programs? I think we should do it Monday or Tuesday. And are we sending it um, with a draft watermark or by that time are we saying that's the final? I don't think it hurts to put draft only because I don't know what's going to happen. I mean, I feel pretty comfortable that it's relatively final, but I don't know what's going to happen between that and us getting it to um, into smart city. Oh, you know what? Okay, so that's a good point. So why don't we put draft, but we say like substantively, this is what, but um, there may be, the final version may look a little bit differently um, depending on what, you know, three months, yeah. yeah. But yeah, that's what we've done in the passive rate grants. Just so they can give, you know, they can start planning. Yep. Say, you know, we're providing this for you um, for planning purposes. However, um, substantively, there won't be changes, but um, it, the format may look a little bit different. Or there may be additional material or information added in the final version or something like that. I think that's fair. Um, okay, so the convening is actually going to be heavy lifting. I, I'm more nervous about sort of the, uh, I think Chris has got great ideas, but. Um, but Chris is very high level, so we got we to gotta bring it down. So I've done um, several convenings for the bank grant. I think getting, um, I think getting people to present is always the hardest. So exactly. that's going to be the most challenging. So I think, um, what are we at Wednesday? Um, I think if we can nail down, so my, my, I am just brainstorming out loud right now. Maybe we do like a 45 minute, one hour panel on like um, some like experts in the area. Um, and then maybe another a, a panel on like existing grantees so we can share best practices. And then um, the third hour is like a breakout. And I think we could put a hold on planning the breakout now, but but I think getting the the, uh, the few people for the first panel that that was um, the part that I had the most challenge when I was doing the bank grant one. So with the bank grant one, like we ended up um, inviting some pretty high level people from um, the legislature and like um, people that um, did like community redevelopment, like experts on that that. And it was it was hard to get them. But I'm hoping if Chris has a contact um, that will anchor it one or two people. And so I would say maybe between um, Chris and, and Kim, if we can get one or two people, then let's just plan around that. And then, and I think our grantees is an easy panel because people want to come in and, and, and highlight their project because they know mm -hmm. it's not with the commission. Do you have some ideas for the grantees already? Maybe we highlight that, um, that, that, that big project, um, Greg, because that's the one that we always talk about, the one point something million dollar project. Is that laugh low? Laugh low? Yeah, but I think this might require us like calling and actually seeing. We, we want to highlight a project that's actually done something. And it's working. <laughs> and it's working. <laughs> um, but, but I think that's an easy call. Like you and I can split that. But I, like I said, that one I think is low priority right now because I think grantee, we can always find a couple grantees. That's not going to be a big deal. Yeah, um, I was just concerned because, yeah, Chris had initially thrown out a lot of, I think, good ideas and potential speakers. But I think the last conversation we had, he said he was having problems <laughs> Uh, corralling people. Yeah, so I, I, I would I would get on Chris because he has a lot a million things to do. Um, and just, you know, because he said he has um, ideas, right? And he'll talk, talk offline. So maybe um, you and him and Christine can get online. I'm my schedule so crazy. If I'm available this week, I can. But if not, then maybe just the two of you can talk to him tomorrow and just get a running list. And I think we got to loop back to remember, um, Lauren was going to reach back out to the, the other housing people. And then, you know, Selena tends to be very helpful because she knows a lot of people. Um, so I, I would just shoot her an email and just say, um, who, who else do you think we should invite? And she might know the contact from those um, 
what Chris was talking about from the, the, the legislature? Because she helped, you know, with the, um, the bill and stuff. So I think she has a better understanding. And I think we just have to start emailing people. So maybe if you guys can work up like a short description of what the convening is, the purpose, not long. It's just something kind of like the save the date thing that you did, Christine, for um, Elizabeth. And then, you know, in, in, in that bank grant folder, Christine, I think um, there, there's some um, like save the date things I sent out that we can recycle. Um, so is, um, let me think about this. Is there anyone else that we need to coordinate on the scheduling? So basically, Chris is- Yeah, they yeah. Yeah, so, yeah, so I, Bonnie already said she's okay with the dates okay. we proposed. Uh, Chris is okay. I haven't heard from Selena. I'll follow up with her. Okay. Um, is there anybody else? I don't think so. Okay. No. Um, no. I mean, I would say for on our side, if uh, Chris, Kim, they're essential. Like, I think Kim is really essential because <laughs> she's a housing attorney. So who, um, who are we sending this out to? I mean, besides, or, or how are we letting people know about this besides our grantees? Because it seemed like we we're opening this up to others. Yeah, we're opening it up, but it's not going to be like to everybody. Um, I mean, we're, we're, it's like targeted, right? So I say larger community, but it doesn't mean like it's open to the public. Uh, you know, it's, it's like it's kind of by invitation. Obviously, if they have more people than they want to forward it to, we don't want to, you know, stop that. But that's why I was trying to hedge it a little bit by saying to Chris, like, maybe we'll invite the external to some like small portion of it. But a lot of it should be for our grantees because we're probably gonna have a short breakout on um, evaluations and we don't want to bore them on that. Okay. Maybe we invite them for the first yeah. half when there's like, you know, more talks about collaboration um and stuff like that but yeah i mean we, we just gotta spur i mean it's just to spur like the discussion kind of a thing um but but i think if we just get one or two other people that he was envisioning we could build a panel around that and obviously i think a good panel we don't want it to be too large but i think like between like three and six is, is appropriate because by the time you have each person like talk for five minutes and then Q and A. That's an hour. Yep. Um. So where can I help? Can you just do it all? <laughs> <laughs> um. I think Christine We're just and I. Recording. Sorry, I just We're recording. Oh, I see it. Yeah. Okay. Oh. Well, they can chop it off at a certain point. I think. But you better be careful. Um, why don't why don't you let Christine and I just?